Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History as we go to war to contain communism. Now, at the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union had taken the surrender of all Japanese forces in the Korean Peninsula north of the 38th parallel. Territory south of that had been surrendered to the United States, as we had agreed to in advance. A division we both insisted was temporary. Uh, and we both wanted, we said, uh, Korea reunified as soon as possible. By 1949, the U.S. and the Soviet Union had withdrawn most of our forces from Korea, but had left behind friendly governments. In the North, uh, the leader was the communist Kim Il-sung. Whereas in the South, the Republic of Korea, the president was Syng Man Rhee. Both of those men uh, maintained large military forces and said they were both eager to reunify Korea by force. The U.S. wanted no part of this. Um, January 12, 1950, Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, um, declared that Korea lay outside the area of American interest in the Pacific. Now, not long afterwards, some reports by the CIA suggested the North might be preparing to invade the South, but those reports were ignored in March of 1950. And then, on June 25, 1950, the North Korean People's Army attacked, crossing the 38th parallel in Soviet-built tanks. And while the South had claimed to be ready for a fight, they were caught completely off guard and pushed back. The South Korean capital of Seoul was captured. Um, and by August 4th, um, about six weeks later, the entire South Korean army and a few American soldiers still in the country were pushed back into a small area around the southern port city of Pusan, where they defended the Pusan perimeter while awaiting evacuation or reinforcement. Truman sprang into action. The concept of containment that lay at the base of funding Greek and Turkish anti-communist activities um, developed fully into the Truman Doctrine, um, proving that if the U.S. relaxed our guard anywhere, the communists would take advantage of it. Indeed, the National Security Council had recently proposed quadrupling um, the U.S. Uh, defense spending, and this gave Truman and Congress an excuse to do so, uh, which boosted the economy um, and let Truman dispute the claim that he was responsible for the fall of China or soft on communism. Pretty soon, the U.S. had three and a half million men in uniform and was spending $50 billion, over one-eighth of the entire gross national product per year, for military purposes. Um, but this was founded on the optimism of America. Um, there's nothing we cannot do. And the New Deal tradition of solving all problems through massive government spending. But while we will contain communism, we will not do it alone. After all, this is now um, a world with an international body to maintain the peace. The United States would approach the United Nations. Now normally, an attempt to get the UN to intervene in Cuba to contain communism would have been vetoed by the Soviet Union, who supported the North Korean cause. But when China had fallen to communism and the United Nations refused to recognize the new communist government and continued to seek the nationalists from uh, Taiwan, the Soviet Union protested by walking out, boycotting the Security Council. And Truman took advantage of this passing a resolution on UN police action through the Security Council the same day that North Korea invaded. And no attending country voted against the measure, Yugoslavia abstained. The Soviets never boycotted a meeting again. And so officially the Korean War would be fought by the United Nations, with troops from Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, France, Canada, South Africa, Turkey, Thailand, Greece, the Netherlands, Ethiopia, Colombia, the Philippines, Belgium, and Luxembourg all participating in combat, as well as non-combatants such as medical personnel from many other UN countries. The Republic of China wanted to participate, but Truman convinced them to sit it out for fear it would restart the Chinese Civil War. Still, the majority of the troops were from the United States, 
and the overall UN commander was General Douglas MacArthur. Um, and this brought the United States into a war without a declaration of war from Congress. Indeed, America has not declared war on anyone since December 8, 1941. Now, two days after North Korea invaded, Truman sent American naval and air units to support the Republic of Korea. Um, and by the end of the week, Douglas MacArthur was on his way from Japan with troops for, uh, from the occupation forces. Um, but he was not going to send um, his new UN peacekeeping force into the Pusan perimeter. Our men were already trapped. Why send more men into a trap? Instead, he planned a daring flanking maneuver to hit the North Koreans behind their lines to attack them at the port of Incheon. Um, in a very risky maneuver. The approach to Incheon was through a fairly narrow passage um, controlled by guns on a little island in the middle of the harbor. Um, Incheon had the second largest tidal range of any port in the world. Um, there's a 30-foot difference between high tide and low tide. There were high sea walls the Marines would have to scale. Some of his advisors said it was a 5,000 to 1 gamble, but a gamble that he made and that he won. On September 15, 1950, the Incheon landing was a brilliant success. It cut off the North Korean People's Army's lines of supply. Within two weeks, Seoul had been liberated and the entire North Korean army driven north of the 38th parallel. And now the question was, should we stop there? It might be foolish to let the North Koreans regroup and invade at some future date, um, once we're again out of the picture. So MacArthur, with Truman and the United Nations approval, pursued the North Korean People's Army across the 38th parallel, and continued to chase them um, until by October, the United Nations was within sight of the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and China. Many North Korean troops fled across the Yalu River and hid in China itself. Now, the People's Republic of China warned the United Nations not to get too close to the Yalu River, but Douglas MacArthur ignored those warnings. And then, on October 19, 1950, 280,000 soldiers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, claiming to be the People's Volunteer Army, all of them on leave from the Chinese Army for the moment in order to avoid a war between China and the United Nations, crossed into North Korea, in many cases armed with Soviet weapons and flying superior Soviet MiG fighter planes. For over a month, um, the People's Volunteer Army and the United Nations forces fought along the northern frontier of Korea. The most famous encounter was the Battle of Chosin Reservoir from November 26 to December 11, 1950, a place that came to be known as Frozen Chosin, as U.S. Marines, British Royal Marines, and the U.S. Infantry froze to death while trying to fight off the Chinese. Um, it was a major loss for the United Nations, with 15,000 casualties, almost 75% of UN forces in the area. Of those casualties, at least half were related to coal, as men lost fingers and toes and the tips of their noses to frostbite. Some men had their eyelids frostbitten and had them amputated. How you live without your eyelids, I'm not sure, uh, but some men had to find out. Some men breathed in air so cold their lungs were frostbitten, and they suffered from that for the rest of their lives. In some cases, not long lives. In other cases, for decades, um, but with lungs scarred by the cold around frozen chosen. Eventually, the Marines broke out. All they said they were not retreating, but attacking in a different direction. Still, um, the uh, Chinese and North Koreans pushed back towards the 38th parallel, um, and soon everyone was back where they had begun, and the communists continued. J uh, J uh, January 4th, 1951, the North Koreans and the Chinese again captured Seoul. Um, Douglas MacArthur demanded a naval bombardment of China, 
He wanted to use atomic bombs against the Chinese army and perhaps their major cities. But the Joint Chiefs of Staff felt that was too much, that it would spark a major Asian war, perhaps a third world war, and the United States, and indeed the whole world, could not afford such a conflict. They said this was to be a limited war, a war just within Korea, over Korea. MacArthur ridiculed the idea of a limited war. He said there is no substitute for victory. He called Truman a pig, an imbecile, a Judas, an appeaser. He even criticized the president openly in public press conferences, which finally went too far. He was ultimately fired by Truman in April of 1951. But many Americans saw him as a hero. He came home to a ticker tape parade and offered a formal farewell address to Congress, saying old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And over the next few years, he would fade away, um, despite some interest in getting involved in politics um, or as becoming a radio personality. Seoul was liberated um, April 21st, 1951, um, and the battle lines would shift a bit here and there over the next few months. But by October of 1951, things largely settled into a stalemate, with the battle lines very close to the old 38th parallel. Um, and after October of 1951, the battle lines would rarely move, um, move at all. And when they did, it was very little. The war dragged on. Um, in 1952, uh, President or Dwight Eisenhower ran for the presidency, um, promising, among other things, to go to Korea and try to make peace, which he tried in 1953, but even Eisenhower failed. One of the big problems was the issue of prisoners of war. Many captured um, communists did not want to go back home. Likewise, the Chinese claimed that many Americans they captured wanted to stay in their communist paradise. The rumor got out that American prisoners of war had been brainwashed by their captors, tortured into accepting and even promoting communist beliefs. In any case, the Chinese refused to release their prisoners of war um, unless we released ours. Um, and many senior officials figured we might as well go ahead and do it, but Truman refused, proclaiming we shall not buy an armistice by turning over human beings for slaughter or slavery, which would surely have been the fate of prisoners of war sent back home. But finally, there was some good news. At long last, in 1953, Joseph Stalin died, and tensions eased somewhat between the U.S. and the Soviets, between the communist world and the free world, and it was agreed that any prisoners of war who did not want to go home would be sent to neutral countries, and from there they could go wherever they liked. Of 98,000 um, Chinese and North Korean prisoners of war, over 22,000, close to 22%, chose not to be repatriated. Um, of uh, 13,000 UN and South Korean prisoners of war, only 359, or 3%, uh, chose to stay in communist countries, almost all of them um, being South Koreans um, who had family or friends in the North they wanted to stay near. Um, and of the very few American and British POWs who chose to stay, most did later return home, saying they had regretted their decision. And so after years of negotiation, an armistice was signed July 27, 1953, at the border village of Panmunjom. The North Korean and American general signed. The South Korean general, though, in the end, refused. So the war did not officially come to an end. Um, but fighting was over for now. A two-and-a-half-mile-wide demilitarized zone was drawn along the battle lines, not too far from the old 38th parallel. And to this day, um, this heavily guarded territory is uh, almost untouched by the foot of man and has grown into a huge wildlife preserve um, and is the center of the most heavily fortified border on Earth, guarded by North Korean, South Korean, and U.S. troops.
Over the course of the Korean War, um, over 54,000 American servicemen and women lost their lives. But the war did boost the American economy and also the Japanese economy as it served as a base for U.S. operations. And um, it would lead to one of the most prosperous periods for Japan, but also in American history.